All right. Hello. I see the attendees number going up. Uh, um, so we'll get going. Uh, for those of you that weren't around, what was it, an hour and a half ago, I am Brian Young, um, the executive director here at Action Network and Action Builder. And with me is Erica Hime. And first, a quick, I'll just say for everyone, a quick congratulations to Erica. She just, I think you're listed on the program as the deputy executive director, but that is not true as of two days ago. So congratulations. Actually, I should say congratulations to Jobs Moving America for, for getting you <laughs> to become co-executive director, making good choice. Um, so yeah, but if you want to um, just introduce yourself, get a little background, um, and then just dive in, you know, how did you, how did you end up here um, doing this work? Uh, and then we'll just go from there. Oh, I love a good story. Hey, everyone. I'm Erica Iheme. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction and the invite and the opportunity to just share a little bit about our world and what we do and who I am um, with the group today. Um, so like Brian said, I'm with Jobs to Move America. Up until Tuesday, I was the deputy director. Now I'm moving into co-ED. Um, but I'm born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm actually based in Birmingham now. Um, grew up in the inner city, north side of Birmingham, um, went to Alabama a and which is a historically Black university, um, studied urban planning, and the last semester of my senior year, a union representative from the AFL came to talk to us about the labor movement in the civics class, and from that conversation, I was actually recruited directly into the labor movement as an organizing apprentice through the AFL-CIO. Um, and from there, I immediately started with SEIU working international as an external organizer. Um, over 13 years, I worked in all of the sectors of SEIU, not including building services and janitors, but I did do hospitals, long-term care, public division, Southern division, higher education, um, Head Start, child care, home care. I, Pretty much most of campaigns in SEIU's portfolio between 2000 and 2015, I probably touched or worked on at some point all over America. I left SEIU and went over to AFSCME and served um, in an effort to get back to the South because I never thought I would leave the South and be gone for so long. But I understood the skills that I was acquiring with SEIU were invaluable and I wouldn't be able to get them back in Alabama where there's not so much of a um, organizing culture per se when it comes to union building. So I just took advantage of that time and just got my skills. Um, and so basically from there, I went to ask me and served as an educator for the Southern region, but I worked all over America. That's when I got a chance to go to Alaska. Um, and as an educator, I, um, you know, I, I developed executive teams. I, um, you know, I did executive level trainings. I did leadership development for members to become um, stronger organizers. I did um, organizing training to teach organizers how to develop leaders out. I did a lot of strategic planning, helping locals think about their five-year, 10-year goals, structuring their organizations, um, culture building. I did a lot of organizational development, um, ODD work. Um, I, I really got a lot of experience at AFSCME. And then at the end of my time there, I moved up to become um, the member organizing um, program manager where I was tasked with building a program where we would take members into leadership and then into organizing. And I did a lot of that at SEIU. So it was a very familiar piece of work that I really enjoyed doing. And then COVID hit. Um, and when COVID hit, I'm in Georgia. My entire family is in Birmingham. Everyone is afraid, you know, people are dying. And I was like, I got to get home. And just so happened, a friend of mine was like, Erica, there's a job with this group called Jobs to Move America looking for someone in Alabama, Birmingham specifically. And I saw the job description and I thought about you. And I'm like, who's hiring in Birmingham for a union? Like, it doesn't make sense. And sure enough, it's a nonprofit organization that focuses on green manufacturing. They had a base in Birmingham and they needed someone to run the Southern program. I was like, okay, that's me. And just so happened, they thought when they put their job description together and the skill sets they were asking for, they thought it was unattainable. They, you know, they were, you know, uh, Madeline is my partner. She's the co, she's the other co-executive. She was like, we were just, you know, wishing for the best. And we thought we were just putting a unicorn out there. And for me, I was looking at it like, 
this is a dream job. Like this, it just couldn't be possible. And sure enough, they were, it was like, it was a match made in heaven. And, you know, when I came over to Jobs to Move America, you know, I asked like, you know, what it is, you know, why Alabama, you know, cause I didn't believe it. I was skeptical. Like people typically, when they think about Southern organizing, there's this mindset where we're going to send people in and we're going to save the South and we're going to, you know, we're going to bring all of our skills and we're going to, you know, show people the way. But in the South, that don't quite work. You know, the South, we trust our own. We work from within and people forget that the South is the reason why we shifted when it comes to issues around racism and racial justice and civil rights. And that was homegrown organizing. So we still have that spirit here. And so that's pretty much how I got here. But I want to talk to you a little bit about who is Jobs to Move America. So Jobs to Move America is a nonprofit organization. We have bases, um, we have um, offices in California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Alabama, and now Mississippi. We are a policy advocacy think tank that's rooted in grassroots organizing in, 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 in an effort to create good jobs in the green manufacturing spaces. And to do that, we work closely, we are a community organization and we work labor adjacent. So we bring labor and community together. We look at ourselves almost like a bridge. We bring labor and community together to work as in partnership to be able to make the impacts that we need to make. That means identifying whatever issues of that community is that's gonna empower workers and get us closer to good jobs, but also, you know, showing solidarity to each other's efforts. I think traditionally when we think about community building and labor organizing, there's always a scenario where labor has a need, they call on the community groups they know, and then they have the community group supporting them in solidarity. And then when that effort is over, they pull out, the community is kind of left to just kind of reel or pick up the pieces. It's a success or it's a failure. The community is just kind of left with the dust. And we have a different mindset about how do we work with community. It's really about having a deep integrated relationship where we work together on the things that are important. So it's not unusual for if a community needs to, you know, get a roadblock put it, you know, put in. You know, labor is an advocate and we're using a, you know, we're working together to try to figure out how do we resolve this roadblock issue. So it's like, it's not a transactional relationship, but instead we're looking at a transformative movement building relationship. And so, you know, that's a part of it, but I think going a little further, it's so much to our work, you know, as a policy advocacy, advocacy think tank, you know, we're working in green manufacturing spaces. America is in a place where we're transitioning from carbonization and into this green economy. And with that, trillions of dollars are being released from the federal government into local, you know, state governments and municipalities to be able to do these infrastructure upgrades. But what that means is that we have a whole new industry that we're building here in America. And what we have to make sure happens is that this new industry is not built on top of the traditions of the American workplace, which is built off of slavery and old Jim Crow. And the way we do that is by trying to influence the government to when they're releasing these funds to put conditions on the funds to make sure that there's, you know, labor standards attached to them to make sure that there's, you know, green, you know, positive green impacts of attached to these resources. Like we cannot lose this moment of creating this new infrastructure and this new um, type of work and not think about the workers in this process. So for us, green jobs are also good jobs. And I could go on and on about it, but I'm going to just pause right here because I know I can go. <laughs> no, it's okay. And this, you know, there's like five things in there that, you know, when Eric and I were talking before this, I said, we don't have to prepare or there's going to be all kinds of different things we can talk about. And it's true because, you know, just going back to one of the core things you're talking about, about the work at um, JMA, but that, you know, that community in, you know, um, community worker, um, sort of solidarity. But, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've heard you talk about before is that it's almost a false distinction to even put those two things separate anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the same people, you know, and, um, you know, one of the things that we always think about is just sort of leadership development in general and just developing leaders who have agency and power um, in their workplace. And I, you know, that really feels like a central point um, of JMA's work and how you look at things. And, you know, I don't know if just, you know, talk more about that. And if you want to dig in 
specifically in Bessemer. He did a lot of work in Bessemer with RWDSU and what that looked like. I love that you asked that question because one of the things that we're really trying to drill in on is the fact that, you know, there is no distinction. Like you said, Brian, like the community are the workers. I, I oftentimes find myself reminding people that everybody at some point in their life is going to be a worker. I don't care if you're disabled. I don't care if you, you know, never had a nine to five or a, a job that has a, a, a W-2 attached to it. Everybody is a worker. Even if you are a stay-at-home mother, you are working for your family. Everybody is a worker. So to think about workers separate from community, you're doing yourself a disservice. So you have to figure out, you know, you know, traditionally we think about only getting to the workers in their workplace, but we really understand that you get to the workers where they are. That's in their churches, that's in their grocery stores, that's in their barbershops, their beauty shops, it's where they're convening that the civil rights movement was built at kitchen tables in people's homes. These people didn't look at themselves as civil rights leaders or civil rights activists or they didn't look at themselves as like just workers or union members. They looked at themselves as citizens who were concerned about the oppression that they were experiencing and they worked together to figure out how to overcome that. This is the moment we're in now when we think about the, the, the modern workplace and the modern workforce. Everybody is having some type of conversation about their job all the time. I get my hair braided. It could take me four to five hours to get my hair braided. When we're getting our hair braided, we talk about everything from our jobs, our partners, um, what's happening on Real Housewives of Atlanta. We talk about everything. And I'm a national labor leader and I'm sitting here among my community having these very, you know, in, you know, thoughtless conversations, but super deep conversations at the same time. And so, you know, you know, for example, with the Amazon campaign, we did a um, a community effort where we called it a um, a, 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 a community a, a, a what a, a community church and community blitz, where we actually um, hit up beauty shops, barber shops, and churches just to do some basic education around unionism the value of unions, but also educate people on the Amazon campaign and the impact that it had on our community. That plant had about six thousand, four to 6,000 workers who had worked at Amazon in the past year. Birmingham has 200,000 people there. So if 6,000 people are working at one place, everybody knows someone who works at Amazon. And we understood that. So we were like, okay, so this is mostly people 30 and under. Um, this is people, mostly women, young women. Um, where do they go? What do they do? They get their hair done. They get their hair done. They get their hair cut. So what we would decide was like, let's bring the community into the conversation. Let's bring the barbershops and beauty shops into the conversation because the beauticians and the barbers are the leaders of the community. When you go into those facilities, that's their home turf. So what's better to do than to get ahead of the curve and go and talk to the people who's convening these spaces and educate them. So when that conversation arises, there'll be at least one person in the room that really knows what's going on. And we're not just talking about what we believe or what we assume, but we got some tangible evidence. Hey, I talked to this person who's working with the campaign. This is what this is about. This is why it's important. And I think that those conversations really help soften the ground um, to where on the second time around with the Amazon um, team that, um, you know, we have to educate people and that education is what closed that voting gap. So the conversation is not about 800 votes this time. It's really about a like less than 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, the you, you mentioned earlier, um, just, you know, organizing the South is something that you really are focused on and, and sort of the structures of Jim Crow and oppression, um, white supremacy, that a lot of the sort of power imbalances um, are still based on and we have to move beyond. But, you know, I think one of the things that was just struck by as you were talking about is that the, you know, in the South, a lot of the um, uh, employers, listen to Cindy Estrada talk about this recently, you know, they, 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 they will, they will just say they're neutral because there's so much political support, um, for them who are trying to, you know, bash the union efforts outside of them and politicians. So, you know, some of the power building you're talking about outside of the workplace is necessary because the oppression is 
not confined to the workplace as well. So just like, you know, there's just one thing I was struck by as you were talking that to build out, we can't think of just the workplace as the, as the battlefield, um, that it really spreads out throughout. And I think, you know, that's not just in the South, that's all over, you know, working with, um, uh, folks in, in communities across the country. It's really, really do have to build supportive power um, so that the political structure doesn't feel free. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, even talking like when you talk about political structures, not only like, you know, the cultural political structures that we all exist in, like church is a political structure, right? Yeah. Um, education systems are a political structure. Like, everything that we function in is a political structure but then you also have the electeds you know mm -hmm. the deciders you know one of the biggest issues that you know we face when we think about like taking on corporations in america is the fact that a lot of corporations are funded by um, state governments and local governments through subsidies tax breaks um you know and it's all in the effort to bring jobs into their community right and so what we have to understand is that like how can we really have a strong influence that's gonna you know force corporations to shift when the very people that we are gonna need to have that impact are being influenced by the corporations mm -hmm. are trying to maintain a relationship with the corporations so it's almost like a double-edged sword so we have to figure out like how do we leverage our relationships to really have a real influence in like you know, step away from the traditional approach of like only getting things done through, you know, electives. You know, what it, what are the other avenues to be able to make an impact and influence people on the ground beyond just going those traditional paths? I think, you know, that base building is going to be really important, but also, you know, that top, that, that, air, that air campaign, you know, what mm -hmm. do we understand that top to identify those leverage points that we could actually make a real impact that's beyond electives? Like, what are the other decision makers? What are the other influencers that can actually have an impact on how these corporations decide to move? So is it the shareholders? Is it the um, customers who have purchased in the products that these companies are manufacturing? Is it, um, you know, the neighborhood news where these CEOs live at? Like, what are the different leverage points that we could identify that can support that ground game? Because it has to be a ground game, which is that base building that we talk about in that community building and, you know, you know, building a solid network of people who are moving from the ground. But also, what are the things up top that we know that we could use to just put that pressure into the middle? Mm -hmm. and, and on the ground game, I, you know, back to, you know, the work you um, sort of sketched out the... Um, the work in Bessemer, but how did you coordinate, um, you know, because you're, you were mentioning the number of worker votes, you know, the gap to close, but, you know, how do you coordinate your community work in like, you know, sort of, you know, granular way with the workers that are being targeted? Um, you know, how much coordination do you follow? You're working constantly with RWD, just sort of sketch that out. You know, so I, for me, like I've been organizing now, 20 years. I'm in my 20th year anniversary. I know I look like I'm only 20, but no, I'm not. I'm 42. Um, but in my 20 years of organizing, I've never seen this type of coordination between community and labor, where labor say, hey, this is the goal we're trying to accomplish. How can you guys help? And then letting the community decide what do we need to help get to this goal? And then deciding what tactics can we use to get to this goal? Like, we had autonomy to decide how to move as a community to support this effort. Um, we coordinated very closely with our WDSG because we didn't want to go out there and make any missteps or do anything that would harm the effort. Um, so we made it very clear, no, we're not talking to workers. It is not our goal to you know, organize a worker and get them to move from a three to a two or from a four to a one. Like that wasn't our goal. Our goal was not to, you know, organize any workers. Our goal was to educate the community so when the union effort came around that they already have some understanding of what's going on. Because I think, you know, in a lot of organizing campaigns, the first part of the conversation is just the basic education. Mm -hmm. So you have to hit a worker two and three times in all those, those first two conversations. You're trying to educate them basically on, you know, what the union is on the first one. And then on the second one, you're trying to, you know, inoculate them and, de you know, 
deconstruct their, their myths or premises that they have on organizing and union building. And then by the third time, you finally get them to say, well, okay, I guess I'll do it. So what we did is we just kind of took that piece of education and just showed them like, you know, this is okay. Like this is gonna benefit all of us. Like when you have a union, you have a voice in your workplace and you get to set the terms and conditions of your employment. You get to set, you know, your wages and your benefits. Like in the absence of that, you're at the mercy of your employer to decide these things for you. And, you know, a lot of workers from Amazon talked about after that first election, how they all got bonuses and raises and stuff like that. And we were here to remind them like, yeah, the threat of a union got you bonuses and raises. What happened when you get a union? So we were there just really to educate the community and the coordination was, you know, the team at RWDSU was amazing. Like they really did not have that superiority approach to organizing with, hey, community, you're inferior. You do what we tell you to do. But instead they were like, hey, we need to get the word out. We need to get people educated. What capacity do you guys have? So for us, that was like, okay, we got people all over the region. Let's get some signs and put signs in our neighborhoods because we know the main streets. We know where people drive. We know where people go. Um, you know, we have access to the churches and we have access to, we know all the barbershops. And we hit 500 barbershops, beauty salons, and um, churches up during this campaign. Um, you know, we did a community, um, a community action rally day where we, you know, it wasn't like a one of those typical union rallies where you have like, you know, 10 or 15 union officials coming out telling people, vote union, vote union, vote union. But instead it was like a very casual space where we rented out a park. We bought, a, you know, about three food trucks out and we opened it up to the public and we had a very small program. We had a local performer, um, you know, who everyone loves, you know, doing some singing. We had a, a, a local DJ um, from the radio sh station. Like they brought their people out and we got on the program and I did like maybe a, a five or 10 minute talk about what this campaign is about. Why does it matter? We had an elected official come out and like encourage, you know, people to talk to their community and tell them about this effort and to support the effort. It was super laid back, but people left remembering like we had a community day, you know, and, and, and labor had something to do with it. So, you know, in their mind, community, labor, okay, so it might not be that bad because these people that I respect and listen to and follow regularly is telling me that I need to pay closer attention to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, one one other question, we'll get to a second, but I'm going to mention everybody. We'll uh, any you can start throwing questions in to chat. Um, we'll uh, we go until 11:45, but uh, we'll do Q and A soon. But last one question, what do you guys think about a question thrown in a chat? But start throwing them in. I will pull them out, um, and we will tackle them as we go. But um, you know, one of the things uh, you know, organizing is hard, and I the thing that always kept me going and alive is that moment when you're talking to someone and they it sort of clicks that they have power you know um is there you know you said you love stories so that's um prodding to see is there is there was there a moment in the um Bessemer uh that you know you talked about one event but um you know conversation within a beauty um parlor church whatever uh that really sort of crystallized the approach that you're talking about, about really sort of cl clicking it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was actually like um, my personal, you know, my personal style is because um, these conversations were happening every day, you know, but I think it dawned on me that we need to have these conversations in these spaces because my sister and I were getting our hair done and, um, the, and she worked at Amazon. And um, the conversation came up about Amazon and my sister, you know, I've been organizing 20 years and she's been seeing me do it for 20 years and she was on the fence. And she was on the fence because she had to go into that job every day and look at big, you know, Jumbotron saying, you know, vote no, or getting her text message with her clock in saying, you know, vote no, or going to the bathroom and seeing a sign behind the style door saying vote no, like, sitting in meetings where they're telling you, you know, the union is not good. You can't get a raise if you get a union. Like it's a captive audience meetings. Like she's experiencing this every day and I'm telling her money, no, like go for it. Like it's okay. And, um, she, and so the conversation came up and then, you know, just listening to people like with their myths, like, you know, unions this and unions are that. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm telling you, like I'm probably one of the most 
you know, like I'm telling you, unions are good. I never paid for health care. I got three babies. I probably paid ten dollars total for all three babies. Like it's because I have a union job. Yeah, I know this. Like, why are we having to have this conversation? And why is it so difficult? You see the evidence, right? Um, and that's when it done. I mean, like people are just really miseducated. People just don't get it. And it's like they're going off of the, the narrative of, you know, corporations who's driving the, the, the conversation because, you know, the truth is whoever leads the conversation wins mm-hmm. and the corporations are winning. Amazon had a whole year between what the first campaign and the second one to do this whole we are a great community partner. Um, you know, we, we, we will we'll pay for your education um you know we're the best job in the region like they had this whole PR campaign that was a whole year second election so basically you have a situation where we have to get to the ground level of conversations because we can't we ain't got no PR money to run a whole one-year campaign on the TV and the newspapers and commercials and everything talking about how great the union is we never have like we have to figure out as a as a movement how do we penetrate the hearts and minds of more people on a broader level? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, so the crystallization was actually in my personal space. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. One quick story for me. I, I mentioned this earlier when I opened the whole thing because my union, I started in TV and film and I had two jobs uh, that were very similar, very similar locations. First one was non-union, second one was union, um, IBEW. Uh, and, you know, the workplace was completely different. You know, I in television, they're always trying to work you a billion hours. And, you know, I had, if I didn't get two days off, I got a penalty day of pay two days off in a row in a, in a week, you know, there's all these kinds of things that were protections. So from there, you know, I grew up in a liberal, but not union. Oh, well, my mom was a teacher. So she was in a union. Um, but you know, it wasn't a big topic of conversation. Um, I was liberal progressive, I pro union, but just that experience of the difference that a union can make, um, for you. And like you said, the, it's not, you know, it's not like there are many TV shows about the difference unions can make. There's a billion on cops, you know, and, you know, police procedurals, but there's not much about a union. So that education um, that you talked about, it is super important. Yeah, I mean, I love that you say that. Like, it just, it, it, it's really puzzling to me. Like, no NFL player will step on the field without a union contract. No LeBron James wouldn't do nothing without a contract. Like, I don't understand, like, it's cool for the elite to have union contract, but the <laughs> everyday working people, like, oh, no, we can't do that. Like, what is this? Like, I don't understand the disconnect. Um, and like like you said, like, you know, maybe it should be in movies. Like, I love watching the movie, and then they just casually mention, like, my union, or, you know, I'm a union member, just casually. And I just be like, and it just be like a moment, but I'd be so excited to just hear the word union on like this mainstream platform because it's it, we're that thirsty for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And where uh, where do you want to go next with um, JMA? Uh, mm-hmm. And what's the focus sort of going forward? How are you going to sort of build out from what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, you know, we want to continue to try to see um you know federal policies that encourage local governments to pick up um you know um like u.s employment plans where you know local governments um you know offer a checklist to people that are bidding on contracts that just say you know we'll offer a standard wage or we'll offer you know this much towards benefits like you know to make them more competitive Mm -hmm. Um, Because what that does is if, you know, a US EP, a a US employment plan is attached to a bid, you know, these contracts get more, they get, the bidder get more points to make them a more appealing candidate to get the contract. And if they get their contract by signing this US EP, then what happens is they're now committed to these things or conditions that they said they're going to make. And by doing that, there's a tangible mechanism in place to where if these things aren't happening when they're hiring that there's an avenue to come back around to and like hold those corporations accountable also like you know we have omb rules that are just so outdated i remember um you know the reagan administration um you know put an omb rule inside of the um sort of office managing budget budget put a rule in place saying like you know if you're a local government receiver from um, federal funds for contracts and procurements 
you cannot put any conditions on the con contractor to hire locally. So there's a ban on local hire. So like, there's no requirement. It's illegal to tell a contractor, I'm gonna give you this contract, but you have to hire the people that live in the area to help work this contract. That's illegal in America. Mm -hmm. And it's just a one line that needs to be changed because we wanna make sure that the local community have access to these good jobs because the truth is these infrastructure bill jobs that are coming up, these green jobs, they are better quality jobs. They have higher pay. And we're still shaping what the quality looks like, right? We're still shaping what that internal workforce look like. But if we can't say to a local government, hey, make sure these companies hire local if they're gonna, if we're gonna use our taxpayer dollars to um, bring these contracts in. We also need more transparency. Like, you know, when we're giving subsidies to these corporations that are coming to town, we need to make sure that the community understands like what are what is the return? What are we paying for with our tax dollars? We're gonna give you, you know, so many hundred million dollars to set up your plant here in Alabama. What does that mean for our community? You know, what kind of assurances can you give us that our workforce is gonna be taken care of, that these are gonna be good jobs? And then we have to really go deeper on the definition of what is a good job. I think when we, you know, in America, we think about a good job, we think about, you know, they pay better than average and they offer some type of health care period, bread and butter. But the truth is a good job goes so much beyond that. It's quality of life. What kind of quality of life can you have and work this job? That's why I feel so deeply for the railroad workers. Like they get paid well, you know, compared to other people. Actually, because their wages have been held back so long that they really ain't what it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. But like they work all these long shifts and they're leaving their family and they're gone for days at a time and they can't take a sick day. So that's a quality of life conversation, right? Mm -hmm. What makes a good job? When you go to work and you're a woman and you're working in a male dominated workforce, are you being cat called? Is mm -hmm. people touching you on your hind side? Mm -hmm. Are people following you to the bathroom? Are people calling you cutest, sweetie baby every day? Like that's not a quality job. That's not a good job or you're not able to get a promotion or even be considered for a promotion to be, you know, in the management levels of these corporations because you're black. Mm -hmm. You give a resume, they don't even take it seriously. You're not even considered because you're black. So a good job is one that's free of harassment, free of discrimination. It's safe. Like people get hurt on a job every day and they're disposed of, and it's almost impossible to get disability in America. So now you're blocked out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Your body don't work no more. So you can't get the type of job that you've been trained to do for the last 10, 15, 20 years, and you're stuck outside of the job market. So, so many conversations has to happen. Um, but for JMA, what we're trying to do is one way to overcome those is we're winning community benefits agreements. Mm -hmm. And basically, in my mind, and I heard um, Maria Salma from the Steelworker said this once before, and it, it was everything for me. Every home in America needs two CBAs, a community benefits agreement and a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. That's how we get good jobs in America. And mm -hmm. basically a community benefits agreement is a contract between the company and the community that set basic terms of what it's like to work in there. So, you know, taking on issues of discrimination, reporting mechanisms of discrimination, creating pipelines into these jobs so the people from the community can actually get these jobs, setting them up with apprenticeship programs to get them the skills necessary to even apply and be qualified candidates for these jobs. Once they get in there, matriculation apprenticeships, like getting people on a path to actually getting the management position jobs. And it's not just a bunch of white guys running the corporation, but instead the corporation leadership looks like the workforce. Like, is so many things we can do. Worker safety, really setting up worker safety committees within these communities. All of these things could be defined within a community benefits agreement. And it is a contract. So that means that it is held up by, you know, laws and, and accountability mechanisms. And if they're violated, then there's arbitration processes to resolve it. Also within mm -hmm. these community benefits agreements, we're fighting for car check and neutrality. People should be able to, you know, form a union without any opposition. Mm -hmm. from employer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's what we want to see happen, um, you know, across America. Um, and, and, and the truth is, the South is the new Rust Belt. 
A majority of manufacturing is moving to the South, has been moving to the South for the last 30 years. It's not Ohio, it's not Michigan, it's not Pittsburgh, it's not Minnesota like it used to be. It's Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Georgia, and other areas that sprawl out of there. I mean, Alabama have five major auto manufacturers in the state alone. Mm -hmm. And that's like we're talking about the subsidiaries who's actually building the products to go into the actual finished vehicles. Like, yeah, I could go on and on. So we want car check, I mean, not car check. We want a CBA and all that entails. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, first of all, it's, I, it's totally true. I mean, that's the manufacturing has been moving south for a while. And you mentioned earlier the infrastructure bill and the um, uh, IRA, the, um, you know, the, um, I forget what, I, oh, Inflation Reduction Act um, with all the green jobs. And, you know, the you, you, woven throughout what you said is the, you know, the idea that this this green economy, you know, needs to be underpinned by some of these agreements you're talking about and the community benefits agreement who like who just talk through that a little bit what's the mechanism the 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 company signs an agreement with the community as represented by by whom i like, just talk through it i think it's really interesting i agree completely that both of them are needed so when i talk about the community it's really you know we're creating coalition spaces Mm -hmm. um, and these coalitions, so for example, the Alabama Coalition for Community Benefits, that's the coalition that um, recently was able to achieve a community benefits agreement with um, New Flyer, which is the largest electric bus manufacturer in North America. One of their largest plants is actually based here in Anniston, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why the Alabama Coalition for Community Benefits Agreement um, was taking on this effort. So basically, number one, we have to turn the community into a stakeholder. Mm -hmm. And how do you turn a community and stakeholder? You create space and you, um, you know, you bring a center, a, a thing to the center that everyone is like in agreement on working towards. And for us, it was getting CBAs for those Aniston workers. And so the coalition served as a, a um, as a counterpart to the employer and the, the, they pursued the employer. They, you know, sent letters to the employer demanding a meeting and got them to the place to where you know, we were able to form a negotiations team within the um, coalition of, you know, our coalition got environmental groups, labor, um, faith-based groups, civil rights groups, human group, human rights groups, all working together around creating good jobs in Alabama, because all of those groups understand that their constituents' quality of life will only be impacted in a positive way if job quality goes up. So that's the first thing. We got a central thing that we all hold on to. And we build a coalition around that and that coalition functions as a stakeholder who goes to these corporations to move them, to get them to a point of a community benefits agreement. Hmm. Um, I've, uh, another question or two, but first I, I wanna make sure um, to get in. There's a lot of um, folks on the call who are in union locals um, and throughout this. And if they, anyone wants to get in touch with JMA, how, Jobs put in a plug. Jobs jobstomoveamerica.org, got all of our names. You know, you can look at your regional teams. Like, you know, we're cur currently functioning um, in the Southern region. We have a New York, New Jersey team. That's the East Coast team. Um, we have the Illinois team, that's Central America. And then we have California, but we also have a national team that's focusing on federal policy. And all of our information, all of our white papers, our reports, um, contact information is all on jobs to move America.org. Okay. The, um, now back the, you know, jumping back to just your history and you as an organizer, um, you know, what, what is, what were the key moments for you when you felt like you really started to learn what organizing really was? You know, it's really interesting that you asked that because I was an organizer before I knew organizing was a thing. Like I told you earlier, like these people at these kitchen tables during the civil rights movements, they identify as activists or organizers. Um, I grew up in the house of community service. My dad was a community leader. I didn't know this until I got into labor that my dad was a community organizer. I mean, I started canvassing and reminding people to go and vote when I was three years old, passing out sample ballots and stuff. I remember you know, organizing contingencies to go down to the city council to advocate for us having a school bus route 
you know, put through our black neighborhoods so we could have safe transportation to school and kids wouldn't get killed by the trains that we had to cross over. Like I had been organizing my whole life. It's been in me. My dad raised us to take care of our community and your community to take care of you. Then, you know, I remember us organizing a walkout when I was in the 10th grade because they were threatening to close our high school down. And our teacher was like, y'all just leave. If they don't want to give y'all school, just leave. And we walked out of our school and walked to the Board of Education and told them not to close our school. I didn't realize that was organizing. So when I came to SEIU as a new organizer 20 years ago, it was like, I'm getting paid to talk to people, mm-hmm. to help people see a better life for themselves. Like, sign me up. Like, it, it, it was a dream. And, and so it, it was always in me. Um, but I think the moments of impact, right? Mm-hmm. The moments of impact when we saw 43,000 home care workers in Michigan who was never, you know, never thought they would be able to get a union, not only get a union, but get an employer of record with a, a Republican Senate and a Republican House and a Democratic governor. And they were able to get real raises. They were able to get respite care. They were able to get access to health care. They were able to, you know, these people were making on average like a dollar and 25 cents per hour in some cases. Like, when I saw them win, I'm like, dang, this is real. Like, it could really happen. I think, you know, watching adjunct professors in, 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 in Southern California who, you know, were only paid on a contractual basis, like $3,000 a semester, and they got PhDs at the Wazoo, you know, they get together and put their feet down. It's like, no, we want a contract. We want a union, we want a contract, and we want to get paid more. Like, to just see every election I've ever worked in to see like literally the change happen overnight. They vote yes the next day, their life at work is different. And as well with political organizing, it's more of a dream or a vision. Like if we get the right candidate, eventually we'll get to where we're trying to go. But with union organizing, it was instant gratification. And it's almost like getting a tattoo. Like you get a tattoo the first time it hurt real bad, but then you want a whole bunch more after that. That's what union organizing felt like for me. It was like, it was hell organizing those workers sitting outside at five o'clock on a shift change with an ironing board and flyers on it, trying to get people to talk to me and not get kicked off or cussed out. And then to see those workers vote and decide that they want to have a voice in their workplace. Like for me, it was a, it was like addictive. Like, oh my God, people actually could change their lives and actually have a say in how things happen in their lives. Like time and time again. And I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it is those moments all right we are uh running out of time anything any last sort of last thoughts mm-hmm. that you want to well i would say um you know this is an action network action builder convening like that is that is key without data you can't do none of this stuff like you know if we don't know how to organize our data and understand, you know, the information that not only that we need to go out there, but what are we bringing back in to help us tell a story and paint a picture of what the real issues are and how people are really feeling, you're nothing. You're nothing. You can't move forward without the data. So I think, you know, just really not forgetting, like, the, the I think the, the, the community engagement, the work engagement, the talking to people, that's the sexy part. But I think the real part is being able to organize the data, manage the data, stay on top of the data, because at the end of the day, that's, that data don't go away. It, it, it lives on, and that's what helps us understand 10 years from now what happened. Conversations get lost, but the data don't change. It tells the real story. Yeah, and it's the, you know, it's one of the things, and I, we were talking about this in a different setting, Eric and I, the, uh, you know, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is, is just how much of our data in our whole movement is based on voting and voter files. And that's not organizing, you know, and people have tried to use like minivan. That's really one of the reasons why we built Action Build in the first place. People trying to use minivan to organize. And, you know, minivan's done good stuff in elections. I'm not slamming minivan, but it's not an organizing tool because it doesn't represent leadership development. Um, and it doesn't track relationships. And to right. me, those are the two biggest things in organ- organizing, building leaders and tracking relationships over time and fostering trusting relationships. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the how we can, um, you know, expand out, because a lot of, and one of the reasons why your work resonates with me so much is the, the you know, the just that, you know, the 
how we can how we can spread out the the data and the tools and the capacity and everything we're doing around organizing so we really do have a society wide power building mm -hmm. sort of strategy um and you know the data in our movement starts to focus on leadership development um and you know all the work that you're doing and jma is doing you can you know you can track leaders as they cross over from workplace to um, beauty salon to church um and really help them grow their power um within all of their parts of their life um and to me that's the you know that's the, that's the holy grail of all this the holy land we're trying to go for <laughs> it's powerful so, that's uh, it. all right well thank you so much erica for coming um and for having your bright and cheery backdrop make my drab <laughs> gray backdrop <laughs> Looks so bad. See the you know sexy organizing drab data. <laughs> you just said it. So anyway, all right. Well, thank for thank you everybody for uh, uh, hanging out with us. And um, uh, I, Jeffrey, uh, next things happen at noon, um, and we've got a program throughout the rest of the day. And as I said earlier, anyone who's here in DC, come on by Bus and Boys and Poets later, or listen if you're not in DC. So. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Peace.